Welcome back everyone. This is my second shot at this. So somebody informed me that the video I made to cover the first lecture of week two, only the first few minutes of it recorded. So this is my second shot at re-recording the uh, video and hopefully this goes well. What we have here is a picture of a PLC. PLC, as you know by now, stands for Programmable Logic Controller. I want to make sure that we connect the information that we're going to talk about this week with the information that we talked about last week. Last week, we spent a lot of time talking about the difference between analog and digital quantities. It turns out that most of the quantities that we would want to measure to control some kind of system, to automate some kind of system, most of those quantities are analog in nature. Analog means continuous. So let's say you have a temperature, you might want some process to do something or not do something depending on a certain temperature or a pressure or force. All of those quantities are analog in nature. The PLC is a digital device. It's a, it's a computer. And as we mentioned in the live stream, the only thing a computer can understand are zeros and ones. We call that machine language, by the way. We can only understand, uh, computers can only understand binary, digital information. And so what we have to do is take the analog information and change that to digital information so that the PLC can understand it. And we spent a lot of time in the last, uh, last week talking about those kind of digital concepts and then why we would even want to digitize information as opposed to keep it in an uh, analog form. So if you didn't get a chance to uh, look at that video from last week, make sure you go through and uh, some good information in there. What you see here is a typical PLC. And the first thing to notice is it does not look like a regular computer. There's no keyboard here. There's no screen. Uh, often when you see a PLC, you would not even recognize it as a computer because many times, more often than not, you will not have a keyboard, you will not have a screen because those devices aren't needed. Once you program the PLC, once the PLC is running and doing what whatever you program it to do, you don't need the keyboard, you don't need the monitor unless you're doing some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, system, what we call HMI, where you want to actually look and interface with different parts of some kind of automated process. We'll talk about that at the end of the semester. If you look at this picture, though, the other thing you'll notice is that it looks like the PLC is composed of these different pieces. Or, or they're actually called modules. This part right here, the power supply, is a, it's, a, it's a module. It's a separate piece. You can actually take off of here. You can, you can pull it away. These, the I.O. sections, I.O. stands for input-output system. These are actually modules. I can pull out this card, that module, and I can plug in another one, or I can move these around in some cases. So one thing to note is that most PLCs are what we call modular in nature, meaning that the sections you can take out, you can remove them, and you can re replace them, you can change them around. Not all PLCs are modular. The smaller ones, uh, you can have PLCs as small as a pack of cigarettes to very, very large PLC systems. But the larger systems definitely are modular. Now, I show this picture of the PLC just so you can have a, a frame of reference as we go through and uh, the course and we talk about the PLC. The only thing you'll have is the software, it's the simulation software. And they try to make it look as real as possible. It looks, looks like an actual PLC. But I think looking at this picture, it gives you a frame, a frame of reference. And we'll actually go in and talk about these, these modules, these individual modules. So the controller here houses the CPU. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about the I.O. section of it, the input-output modules. We'll talk about the fact uh, that there's basically a couple types of modules you can have. And we'll, we'll dig down, we'll drill down the, uh, into this, but this picture will give you, definitely give you a frame of reference. So what I want to do now is move on to the uh, actual PowerPoint presentation, and we have two that we have to cover today. Okay, here's the first PowerPoint. What I want to do is give you an overview of programmable logic controllers. 
And I want to start by saying that a PLC, or Programmable Logic Controller, basically replaces electromechanical relays. Now, we talked a little bit about this during the first week. We talked about, and you should know now precisely what a, what a relay is and, and kind of how it's made, what it, what it looks like. You know that a relay is an electromechanical switch, and you know by taking switches and connect them, connecting them either in series or parallel, I can, uh, I, can, I can get them to perform a type of logic. If they're in series, that logic is called and logic. If those uh, switches or contacts are in parallel, it's called or logic. And by combining and or logic and then the normally uh, button, the normally closed push button that we refer to as a not, not logic, by combining those, you can actually, uh, you can, you can actually control pretty, pretty involved, uh, pretty involved processes. Well, the problem with that old way of uh, controlling devices and processes is well there's a lot of disadvantages one is the amount of wiring that you would need to control a complex process like say an assembly line for GM or Ford if a PLC controlled assembly line if you go back to the old way of doing it where they actually had racks of switches and relays controlling the assembly line the, the PL the one controlled by the computer the PLC would have much much less wiring as a matter of fact Typically, 80 to 80 to 85 percent of the wiring in any kind of control system, you have the, the the circuitry you're controlling, and then you have the logic to control that circuitry or devices. Well, 80 to 85 percent of the wiring is just for the logic part of it. Well, the PLC does away with all of that and replaces it with software. So as we go through the course, it'll become crystal clear the advantage of uh, of uh, of a PLC over regular hardwired logic. Now mentions here a PLC is a solid state device designed to perform logic functions previously accomplished by electromechanical relay. So for us in here the word solid state just means no moving parts. So I have these devices, they're electrical devices so they don't have any moving parts. What can a PLC do? What kind of tasks can PLCs perform? Well, here's a list. PLCs can mimic actual real-world devices. So relay switching, uh, PLC can actually turn a relay on or off. It can actually mimic a relay. Counting, well, in the old days, and even in the early PLC days, there were actual count counting devices you can connect to a PLC, or if you had a uh, hardwired logic that you were using there were there were ways to, to count in those type of circuits with a PLC you can actually have the, the device count but it will it will mimic that hardware device called a counter so PL, PLCs can switch things off and on with relays and not just relays but we'll talk about other types of switching it can count calculate compare and then this last one down here analog signal processing well what's that about well, you'll remember from the live stream that, as I said at the beginning of this video, most of the information that we take in from uh, everything outside of the PLC, we're going to refer to that as the, the field. We call devices that are not internal to the, the PLC, we call those field devices. So like a switch would be a field device. So if that switch or sensor is taking information from the factory floor, the field, and I want to send that to the PLC, well, since the PLC is a computer, I have to first take that analog signal and I got to do something to it. I have to digitize it. And as you know from last week's lecture, digitizing that signal is a process. So I got to sample it. I got to go through all of that stuff that we talked about in the last week's uh, digital conversation when we had that. So part of this analog digital processing is going from analog to digital when I need to do that. And there's other parts too, like uh, compensating for noise and other changes and voltages or currents that we really don't need to get into in this class. So be familiar with this slide, some of the things that we can perform. These are the main, the main tasks performed by PLCs. Well, what kind of advantage 
does a PLC have over the old way of doing it, hardwired relay control? The most important thing is what I said earlier, you have to hardwire a relay. You have to physically go and wire the relay, and then if for some reason you have to change it, you got to go in and rewire it. Now, that might not seem like a big deal, but imagine for the General Motors, when they go from one model year to the next, to another model year, if they require any kind of changes, you, you, there could be literally thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of wires and connections that would have to be rewired or changed. Not so with the PLC because most of that logic stuff, as I said earlier, is done in software. So there's no, or there would be very, very little rewiring that would have to be done. Relays are hardwired. That's a big disadvantage. PLCs are solid state. Solid state devices can be made really small and they're getting smaller by the minute. And so another advantage a PLC has over relay logic control or relay control is I can make the device small, very small. We mentioned the term solid state. Solid state means there's no moving parts. Everything is done electrically. And if I don't have moving parts, um, I don't really have to worry about things breaking. Usually mechanical devices break. They, they're fatigued or, or there's a lot of friction that causes issues. You don't have that with solid state devices. One thing you do have with solid state devices that can be a problem, usually electrical devices are destroyed by heat, so things can overheat. But as far as when wearing out, just kind of from, from use, wear and tear, there is none because there, there are no moving parts. Low power consumption, being solid state and low power consumption kind of go hand in hand. So the fact that uh, a device is solid state, solid state devices by their very nature, they, uh, they require less power than uh, non-solid state devices. That can be important as we move on. As you guys know, a lot of uh, devices now are operated by battery. Instead of plugging in something into the, to the wall, we use batteries. And battery technology is really improving. But this low power consumption helps out a lot if you're going to run any kind of device off a of battery. Lower power consumption, longer the battery life. Ease of expandability, I can add to or take away from the PLC since it's modular. It's a lot of flexibility in that. And then security, well, a PLC is a computer. So any way you can secure a computer, you can secure a PLC because a PLC is a computer. So... What are some of the ways that we can we can uh, secure a computer? Some of the older devices actually had a key lock on them. So you had an off one switch on the computer tower. But if you ever seen a computer tower, tower with a key switch, you can actually turn the thing off and on that way. But passwords and, and, and those type of things, thumbprints and all the, anything you can do to secure your cell phone can basically be done with a PLC or any other machine, any other digital machine. This is very important. I want to, this is a, it's a short sentence, but it's, a, it's an important sentence. Import, it's important to helping you understand how a PLC operates. The PLC is an event-driven device. So that word event-driven, what does that mean to be event-driven? All that means is the PLC is going to sit there and it's not going to do anything until, until something happens in the field. Now, I've already mentioned the term field, but let me re-explain that. Imagine a, a piece of paper and on the, in the middle of the piece of paper, you draw a square. You draw a rectangle, a square. Label that PLC. So anything inside of the PLC is, is we call that software. We'll talk more about that in another video. But anything in, inside the PLC is virtual stuff, it's software. Everything outside of the PLC, that's hardware, that's stuff that you can touch. Those devices that live outside of the PLC, like a switch or sensor, or maybe a motor that the PLC might control, those are called field devices. So this slide says the PLC is an event-driven device. It's going to just sit there and sit there, it's going to sit there forever until something happens in the field until a switch closes or a sensor triggers or trips. Something has to happen in the field. That's what we call by an event. And once the PLC senses that event, 
then it'll do something in response to that event. Now, if you think about this, it won't make a lot of sense right now, but as you start to use your simulation software, and we go more into the way ways that the POC uh, operates, uh, this, this slide, if you understand this idea of being event-driven, things will make a lot more sense to you. The main parts of a POC, what are they? Well, I want you to think of it like this. There's a, there's a list here, but in the next slide I'm going to show you an actual picture. I, often I think the picture is a little easier to remember. But the CPU is important. CPU stands for Central Processing Unit. The I.O. section is very important because that's where we actually connect things that we're going to control and sensors and switches to the actual PLC. So I.O. stands for Input Output Section. There's the power supply, and then there's the program device, and the name of both of those are descriptive of what they do. What we will do in a future slide is we'll go in, a future uh, presentation, we'll talk about the various sections of the PLC. We'll talk mainly about the CPU and the I.O. section. We won't really say a whole lot about the power supply, and I think I'll say something about programming devices later. So the PLC definitely, the PLC, not, but not only the PLC, all computers, all machines have these same parts. So any computer or thing that we consider a computer like a cell phone would have these same parts, CPU, I, some kind of I.O. section, power supply and programming device. Your cell phone has a CPU built in, a central processing unit. You have a, a input section, your microphone is an input, your keyboard, when you text, that's an input. Output section would be a screen, speaker. All of these things that we're talking about here not only apply to PLCs, they apply to all computers. And remember, we said a computer is anything that contains a microprocessor. Now, this is the picture I was referring to earlier. This is the one you want to remember. So this picture breaks it down. Uh, your I.O. section consists of input modules and output modules. The input modules where we connect our switches or sensors to that sends the information from field, field devices into basically into the PLC and the output module is what the PLC will control. It might be a motor or a lamp, something of that nature. Programming device. Now these are interesting because with the PLC many times the, the programming device is itself basically a computer. It has its own memory and everything. You can program the programming device but that program is going to live in the programming device until you move it from the programming device down to the CPU. Once you've moved the, the program from the programming device down to the CPU, you can actually remove the programming device. You don't need it anymore, and the PLC will work just fine. And that's why I said earlier, if you were to walk into a factory, you, uh, you, might, not, you might walk right by the PLC. It might not even recognize it as a computer. If you're looking for a keyboard and the mouse and all of that, you might not find that because, uh, as I said, once the PLC is programmed, you no longer leave the programming device unless you're going to edit the program in some kind of way. And then there's the power supply. The CPU and the memory, we'll spend some time talking about the CPU, but for now, this is kind of where all the action takes place. Your program is stored there. Uh, this will manage the, 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 the internals of the system. So the central processing unit, this will do all the calculating and comparing that we talked about in the other slide. So the CPU, central processing unit, we'll talk about that uh, in a future slide. Here's a list of input and output devices. And I'm not going to read this to you. You can kind of look over this. There's actually tons of in input devices for PLCs. And of course, there's tons of things that you can hook to a PLC that you will want to control. But here's some of the main ones. So, you know, if you mark this slide, and by the way, on um, on Canvas, I have a uh, I have or I will have a, a picture of the way you want to print these PowerPoints out. If you're actually printing these out, you want to print them out the note pages out three to a page, and then what you can do is as you watch these videos. 
things that I say are important or that are going to be on the exam, you can just kind of jot it down directly on your note pages and put it in your three ring binder, which I know you all have. This is an important slide, so if you're taking notes, you want to mark this one. A field device versus a real world device. What is a virtual device? A virtual device is any device that can mimic a, an actual physical device. So the three virtual devices, relay, that's the most common. A relay is, you can have a physical relay, you can have a virtual relay or software relay. So I can mimic a relay or the function of a relay inside the PLC memory. A timer, there's an actual timer. In the old days, they would have a physical timer that you would hook to the PLC. Well, nowadays, the timer is actually mimicked in the memory of the PLC. And the beauty of that is I can have as many of those software timers or relays as I want. And counters, the same applies to counters. So a virtual device is anything that is duplicated in software. Any kind of real-world device or actual device that's, that's, that's uh, duplicated in software. So again, I'll, I'll, I'll ask about this at some point. So you want to make sure you're familiar with the term virtual device and be able to cite examples of virtual devices. Now let's look at a simple process a control process. So I'll give you a second. I'll pause for a minute and let you read this. So I mentioned that I uh, got rid of the uh, book back in 2004 and I went through and I made these slides. So I've been using these slides since 2004 so my artwork is not the greatest here but hopefully you can see what's going on I have this big mixing vat or, or tank big mixing tank I got this field valve that's putting some kind of liquid in this tank and I have two sensors I got a pressure switch or sensor and I got a temperature switch and if you notice over here it says the temperature and pressure switches close their respective contacts when conditions reach their preset values. Now that's important to know this when you're at, when you're connecting to a PLC system or you're using contacts that are normally open or normally closed because that's going to dictate how you write your program. That turns out to be pretty important. But in this case, these are normally open switches and when uh, whatever value you have these set for, when the pressure or the temperature reaches that that value that you set then the contacts are going to close so the problem statement says the mixer is used to automatically stir the liquid when the temperature and pressure reach preset values so you know you're dealing with some kind of and circuit but it says also the mixer can be controlled directly by the push button so now you're dealing with two things here you got the temperature and the pressure have to reach certain values or you can control it with the push button I'm trying to show over here I got this manual push button you might want to some reason turn this thing on manually so what would the if you're going to hardwire that if I were, I'm going to pay you to wire this up and you want the logic to be as defined in this statement here what would that look like well here's a ladder we talked about a ladder in the live stream here's a really basic ladder Let's look at this. Now remember the way you read these ladders, you have the two lines. The one I showed you in the live stream, just for you to think about it the right way, I had these these lines here, but then I had a battery down here. So you really don't have a battery down there. It's just a way to think about it to help you to understand it. But you do have L1 and L2, which are the well, these are the main lines. And in between there, here we have the pressure switch. And then we have the, te the temperature switch. And notice they, they're hooked in series, which basically that's and logic. And that's exactly what we want. When the temperature reaches its preset value, that's going to close. Or the, the temperature is going to close. And then let's say the pressure reaches its preset value. It's going to close. That's going to start the, the, the motor. If the temperature falls below that value, it's going to stop the motor. So here's the and part of the statement. Or... 
if you push the manual push button, these two switches are bypassed, and then I have, remember the way you read these ladders, we think of power is flowing from left to right, so it flows from left to right always. So if I push this normally open push button down, then I will bypass the AND circuit, and that will also start the motor. This OL there, you can just ignore that. Usually in the ladder, the last thing on the, the rightmost thing is the thing you're controlling. So anything over here on the left, those are all inputs. And then the last thing on, these are called rungs, like the rung of a ladder. The last thing on the rung is always the output that you're controlling. This OL stands for overload contact. So act like that wasn't there. And the last thing would be this. This is what you're controlling, the motor coil. Okay, well, you'd have to actually physically wire wire this up like this, but let's say we were going to do it with the PLC. How would I do this exact same thing if I could use a PLC? What would that look like? Well, what you would do is, this represents the input module of a PLC. This is the input module. Now, remember, the input module, they're, they're labeled here, one, two, three, four. Now, we'll get away from counting like this. Digital devices never start counting with one. We always start counting with zero. So instead of having these, the terminal numbers, one through four, it will be zero through three. But, but, but that's another conversation. But here's the point. Notice I'm not, the only thing I'm wiring here, the only thing I'm wiring is I'm, I'm from, from the power line over to the input module, I'm gonna wire the switch. There's a screw terminal here, unscrew that, Screw it down on that wire, and I'm wired. I'm wi every input device is wired directly to the screw terminal, and that's pretty much all the wiring I have as far as the inputs. Now compare that to this. You have to wire this whole thing. Now these are just three switches, but what if you had 30 switches? Well, all 30 switches would connect right to the input modules just like this, and there really is no wiring. Notice also that this number here is important that's called the input output address so this is an input module so this would be the input address input address of what well what it will do is it'll actually map a control on the program you're going to write to this physical screw terminal so let me show you what that program looks like it looks like this now you'll use a programming language called relay ladder logic and here's an example of it so those switches are basically inputs are represented by this looks like a normally open contact that's exactly what it's designed to look like what you'll notice compare this to this i have a pressure switch i have a temperature switch i have a push button but here i don't have anything this is all software this is all done in software and so i can see that this thing right here, whatever that input is, is mapped to whatever this address is pointing to. What is that address pointing to? Well, that address, 001, is pointing to the pressure switch. And look at 002. It's pointing to the temperature switch. So you can see the beauty of this. Instead of, you don't, there's no wiring here. You connect the switch to the PLC and all the wiring, and I'm doing air quotes, you guys can't see it, is done in software. You just basically drop and drag this here. You hook these up in series in software, and you never, ever have to physically wire anything. So 85% of the wiring is eliminated. The only wiring that's done is connecting the sensor or switch to the actual controller itself. And so everything is done here. This is called ladder logic, and this is how you do your programs. This slide I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about. You can read this yourself, but I do want to say, make sure you go through it. You need to understand the cycles, what a cycle is. But the, the important part of here is uh, these, these, these last two points here. Read everything here, but when you get down to the last two of the five, this idea of a scan, scan cycle, and then um, the time for one scan is called the scan time. Turns out that's pretty important. So I'll go into some detail at a later date and explain this in detail, but just kind of in the nutshell, 
most programs, when you use them, they just kind of run through in the sequ sequ sequential fashion. It just kind of goes from the top to the bottom unless you tell it to start over. Well, POCs, they don't work that way. They go in the loop. So they, they have this loop they go through. It's a scan, it's called a scan cycle. And then that scan cy cycle will do certain things and then go back to the top and keep repeating the process. So if you have something in the field, you got some operation that's, that's moving faster than the scan cycle, then you can see where that could cause an issue. So read, you know, mark this slide, study it, but the ones to pay attention to are these last two bullet points. And on this next slide, we talk about uh, PLC software. There's two types. There's programming tools and monitoring tools. We're going to spend most of our time over here. So these programming tools is the way you enter the program and the type of language you use and all of that to make up the logic. Monitoring, you're able to, well, in some cases, you can make a, a uh, what we call a interface for the PLC or you can have some kind of system set up to where you can actually see a pictorial view of what's going on in some kind of automated process. So we won't deal with anything on this side. But just realize there's two types of software for the PLC, and we're going to look at programming tools. So that's the first PowerPoint. It turns out there's two. This is the end of the first one. So I'm going to pause for a minute, let you catch your uh, breath, or I should catch my breath, and then we'll start the second PowerPoint. Okay, here is the second PowerPoint in our discussion, and if I go into here, you'll see me jump right back to this picture, which was in that last PowerPoint, so you're seeing this twice, which means that it must be important, and actually, you'll see this in other, other uh, videos that we do. So, again, mark this slide, study it, look for this, or some form of this to be on exam number one. So we have these uh, sections of the PLC that we referred to, identify here, and, and uh, the last PowerPoint, we kind of did an overview of the PLC and then how it operates, and here we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to go into a little bit of information on the I.O. section and some other parts of the PLC that I hope you find interesting. Now. It says here the input-output modules provide the equivalence of eyes, ears, and tongue to the brain of the PLC, which is the CPU. And let me say that another way. With the PLC, or any, any device like a uh, microcontroller, there, there are just tons of different types of sensors. For every sense that you have on your body, there's a sensor to mimic it. So we have sensors that can, that can pick up almost any and everything. So there's tons of different sensors out there. That's the main point of this slide. This slide says refer to the PLC. So I mentioned, guys, that if we were meeting face-to-face, -face, I would have brought in a actual PLC. And I would have set it down in front of you. I would have pulled maybe some of the modules out so you can see that it, it was indeed modular. you will be able to point to it and touch it. And so this is referred to the PLC, and so I don't have it because we're doing this by remote, but that's why I showed that picture of the PLC, which is the first thing we started with in this video. So think about that as you go through this. I'm not going to read these to you. You can kind of read through this yourself and just kind of be familiar with some of the language here and uh, some of the things that different parts, like the input modules, what they do. You can kind of take this and look at yourself. But I want to show you a picture of what that's talking about. This is called a physical rack. So this is some of the terms here. You have the processor sac section. You have the chassis, which just holds the cards. It holds the modules. They call this thing a rack. And the rack can have a rack number. But but this 128, it's a 128 I.O. rack. Well, well, what is that all about? Well, it turns out, and we'll go into this next week, but we're dealing with uh, machine language, and as you know, machine language is based on something called binary. We got to talk about binary in a little bit more detail, but that means that anything that we do related to a number has to be a power of two. A power of two. And so, for instance, uh, we'll talk about, uh, you know, a bit, 
a one or a zero. When we group bits together, we we, we have these size, these precise things called bytes. A, a, a byte is basically eight bits. It's always going to be a power of two. So two to the third is eight. So we use that number. And you'll see there's other numbers as we go through the class that are powers of two. Well, it turns out that here I have zero through seven, which is eight. These are the the input cards, 0 through 7. I have eight modules or eight cards here. Each of these cards will have 16 screw terminals that you, you can connect to. That's 16. Again, a power has to be a power of 2, right? So 16 is a, is a power of 2. There will be 16 screw terminals I can connect here. I can connect wires to. Well, if you take 16 times the 8, you get that number, the 128. That 128 I.O. rack is what they're referring to. Now, this is a physical rack. I want to talk about something called a virtual, a virtual rack or a logical rack. Now, um, you have to kind of, I actually referred to this, I believe I referred to this in the, in a, um, in the live stream, but there's this 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 table, actually two tables. One is called a input image table. The other is called an output image table. So let me let me see if I can find that document. I'm going to bring that up, and let's talk about that. And then this logical rack will make a little bit more sense. Okay, so here's one of the diagrams, or one of the documents that I put up on Canvas for you to look at. And this is an example of a logical rack. Now, two terms I want you to, to know. The term logical or virtual mean the same thing. What that means is it's not physical. It exists only in memory. This is a way to think about how memory is organized. So we have in memory, and we'll talk about in the next presentation what, we, what, what is memory. But in memory, you have these two tables. So I want you to think of there's numbers here, but think of sales. So the actual table is like right here. It starts here and all of these. Over here, these are just the addresses, right? So these sales, I'm not showing the sales. I'm showing, look at, look at the number system. We go 0 up to 7. We skip 8 and 9, and we go from 10 to 17. So we'll talk about that next week. That's a special numbering system. But if you count these, it's 0 to 7, which is 8, and 10 through 17, which is 8. So I have 8 and 8, which is 16. So this is a byte, and this is a byte. A, a byte is 8 bits. We'll talk about something called a word. And for us, a word is going to be 16 bits, which is the reason I'm showing 16, 16 cells here. Think of these as cells. And these numbers are just the number of the cells. This table here is called an output image table. So what happens is, is that these cells, which these numbers represent, would hold a 0 or a 1. So maybe, let's say right here, in this cell, cell that's cell number 4, but it's the fifth cell because I started counting with 0. But in this cell right here, that cell number 4 can hold a 0 or a 1. And I can address this because I know this O, that's an O and not a zero. That's the, this is an output table. And if I move to the, this is, this is row number one, or card number one, and this is bit number four. So I can, I can get to that bit. If I want to look at it or change it, I know how to find it. So everything in this table is address. Give me the row and the bit number. I can get to any binary information stored in this table. So I have an output image table, and I have an input image table, and basically this mimics a physical rack. So for every screw terminal you'd have on the physical rack, you would have this table to represent those screws that you can connect wires to, only this exists in memory. So I'm going to refer to this a lot in the class, the output image table and the input image table, and as we get in the future slide, future uh, lectures, you'll understand this more and more. So look at this document. It's on Canvas, and make sure you read what's down here. And uh, 
the, the only other thing is when you guys get to using the simulator, when you use a simulator, this output image table and input image table, they refer to that as a data table in your simulation software. So this is what we mean by a logical rack. So I'm going to go back to the So now that you had a chance to look at that diagram that says refer to handout, now that you had a chance to look at that logical rack, hopefully this makes a little bit more sense when you read down through here. So it says a logical rack is a virtual addressable unit. Remember what I said, if something is virtual or logical, what that means is it exists in memory and in memory only. That's important to understand because with PLCs we have two types of devices. We have real world devices, things you can hold in your hand, but you can have the same thing that exists in memory. I can have a virtual device or software device. So one of the things we'll talk about is that we've already talked about a relay, a physical relay. Well, there are, there are also virtual relays in the PLC and other virtual devices that we'll talk about. So make sure you Remember that idea of being virtual, virtual or logical. The rest of this you can kind of read yourself. Uses eight words in the output image table file. It uses eight words in the input image table. Kind of read this and look at the diagram I just showed you when you study this stuff. And then see if you can um, draw a parallel between what this is saying and uh, what is being shown in that, that uh, logical rack I just showed you a few, a few minutes ago. With the PLC, like with any computer, you can connect one computer to another. That's called networking. You can do the same thing with the PLC. Here we have basically two PLCs, or in this case, you have a PLC and you have a remote rack. So maybe I have a PLC with with uh, input-output modules here. Notice it's called local I.O. And then somewhere else in the factory, I can have more I.O. or even another PLC that I, that I connect to. Now, why would you want to do this? Well, it turns out that you can greatly reduce wiring if you have some kind of really large industrial process you're controlling. You have a lot of inputs and outputs. Often, if you have several racks hooked up around the factory or wherever this is located, you can reduce the wiring. But you got to connect the PLC to the remote rack or racks. And how do you do that? Well, the main two ways we do that we use uh, some kind of communication medium. There's three communication mediums in use today. There's cable, there's fiber, and then there's wireless. For wireless, the communication medium would be uh, electromagnetic radiation or radio wave. We don't look at that. We look at these two. We look at coaxial cable, or coax for short, and fiber. That's fiber optic cable. You're all familiar with coax. Coax, if you ever hooked up a cable connector to a TV, you were hooking up coaxial cable. And you know that if you looked at it closely, it has a copper wire coming out the center. It has some kind of braided shield around the inside of a vinyl jacket. You know that you can take that wire and you can make, uh, you can tie it into a knot if you want to. It's very, very flexible. And so I can use that type of wire or a cable that's very similar to that to connect to a PLC in a remote rack. But look at the maximum distance. With coax, the maximum distance you can have would be two miles, which might seem like a, a lot of wire, but trust me, if you have a really, really big factory, like again, General Motors or Ford, and you're running wire back and forth in that factory, two miles uh, would be nothing. You can run many many miles of wires with when you're dealing with these automated automating processes so the disadvantage of coax is that this is relatively short compared to fiber look at fiber now what is fiber fiber is a glass or plastic cable that doesn't carry electricity coaxial cable is just wire it carries electricity fiber or fiber optic cable carries light and so uh, notice one right off the bat that look at the range of fiber, 20 miles compared to two, 10 times of what you have for coax. The other thing is this low noise. Noise in um, 
noise in an electrical circuit is caused by by many different things, but it's usually manifested as some kind of voltage or current in a place where it shouldn't be. And sometimes you, you'll know the static or some other kind of indication that you have a signal that shouldn't be there. Well, that's what part of the braiding is around coaxial cable. It's designed to reduce noise. And so, uh, but if I know this here, this is very low noise because, well, the reason it's lower than coaxial is because uh, noise is usually caused by radio waves or electromagnetic radiation. But this is... Uh, Basically, you're transmitting light here. You're not even transmitting electricity. You're transmitting light. So the, the frequency of radio waves that affect coaxial cable would have no effect on light at all. So this is low noise. Well, what's the disadvantage of, of fiber? Well, number one is the cost. It's way more expensive than coaxial cable. The second disadvantage, a big one is, remember we talked about how flexible coaxial cable is? So you actually got a job running cable in the factory for this PLC to work. And you had to do, let's say, a bunch of 90 degree angles. You had to go around the corner. You could do that real easy with coaxial cable because it's really flexible. But with fiber, you cannot make a sharp 90 degree turn, turn with fiber. You'd have to cut the cable and do spe special splicing, which takes some level of skill. So fiber is more expensive which is a disadvantage, it's harder to work with. It takes special skills to work with it, which is a disadvantage. But the advantage is it's low noise and range. The coax cable doesn't have a lot of range. The advantage is it's flexible. It's also inexpensive compared to, to fiber. So I would mark this slide, I think, on the exam. I do ask about this. Again, that's Exam is designed to be taken in class, so I don't know how I'm going to do it since we're doing this remote stuff. But some kind of way, this will, this will come back at you. So make sure you take a look at that. I'm not going to say a whole lot about addressing. You'll learn the addressing schema when we start with the, uh, with the uh, software, the software simulation. But here's the importance of addressing. What we got to do here is you got to take a switch. Now, you imagine... You got 100 switches in the factory, in the field. 100 switches, all connected to a PLC. That switch, or the state of that switch, has to some kind of way be mapped to the inside of the PLC. Now, where it's mapped to is that input image table that we referred to earlier in this presentation. So everything that's connected up to the PLC through the input module has a place that can hold a bit in the memory in the input image table or output image table. And the way you map a screw terminal to a position in the input image table is by addressing. So that turns out to be pretty important. <clears throat> Excuse me. This talks about types of addresses. You can read that. But look at this one. This is the one I want you to focus on. Now, Different PLCs will have different address schemas, but I just want to show you how what we start with, we start real wide and we narrow down like a funnel. This says, okay, what kind of address is this? Is this an input address or an output address? Well, this is an O, so that's for output. If it were an input, that would be an I. And in this addressing uh, schema, once we identify whether we have an output or input, address or file that we're talking about then we got a file number which makes it more specific then we got a rack number which makes it more specific and then in that rack we have a group number which makes it even more specific and then the last thing we have is a bit number so if you remember in that input image table where I referred to those roles as cells and we looked at I think I said bit number four you might have a thousand bits that you're manipulating, but you have to be able to zero down to the exact bit that's representing a certain state of a switch, whether the switch is open or closed. And this is how it's done. We map a physical screw terminal down to a actual cell in that input image table or output image table using addressing. So we'll come back 
to that at a later slide. It's pretty important. Well, you can read this yourself. I'm not going to talk about these uh, I.O. module cards. You can read this for yourself and get that information. And that ends this discussion. So, again, this is my second attempt at this. The first uh, video I put up was right around 59 minutes. And this one I see it's going to be about 51 minutes. So, I think I went a little faster here. I guess because I had practice. So, uh, hopefully this works this time. Guys, have a great rest of the day. And I will uh, see you next time. Thank you.